Welcome to Central Study Hour at Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. Wherever you are and however you are joining us, we're so glad you're here, especially because today I have some wonderful news. Months ago, as you may know, we were voting on whether or not to continue our media ministry. We were praying for direction on where to go. And I'm happy to say that today, not only are we live and on air and streaming, but we are continuing on 3ABN, amen? The channel is Proclaim and Central Study Hour will be airing at 6 a.m. on Sabbath morning and I believe 8 p.m. on Friday mornings. You know, we just thank God for providing for us to be able to continue this. We, with this ministry, reach so many people that we would have otherwise never heard from, never communicated with. Our first hymn this morning is hymn 434, We Speak of the Realms. Comes as a request from Nina Brown in Trinidad and Tobago. So we'll sing the first and fourth verse. Amen. I love the song where we can hear the bass and the tenor, and the men have a part and the women have a part. Thank you for singing that with us. If you have a special song request, I actually have a new place for you to visit this morning, so listen closely. Uh, you can email at us at csh at saccentral.org and visit us on our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash saccentral. We'll take any request from in the hymnal, an oldie, a newbie, uh, one that we may not have sung before. We'd be happy to hear from you. So our next song, our final song this morning is hymn number 10. We're praising the Lord this morning. We've come to worship him and adore him. Come Christians, join to sing, Alleluia, Amen. We'll sing the first, second, and third verse.
forevermore. Alleluia. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy Sabbath day. We're happy that you've blessed us to come and worship you together, to come as Christians singing um, for your glory. We ask that this morning you come into our hearts and our minds and, and let us actually come into our stomachs as well. Help us partake of the bread of life that, that we will read and study this morning. Um, we ask that your Holy Spirit be with Pastor Chris, that his message is one that is from you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our lesson study will be brought to us by Pastor Chris Buttery, our senior pastor at Sac Central Church. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath to you. It is good to see you and trust you well. Had a good week and survived coming together to open God's Word and share again. What a blessing. Amen. Amen. Tell you what, the uh, lessons that we've been enjoying from the book of James have just been, a, have been tremendous, haven't they? I hope you're enjoying them as much as I am. And we're going to be delving in again and looking at lesson number four, being and doing. Being and doing. We want to welcome all of those who are also tuning in, uh, whether you're viewing live stream or wherever you're tuning in from. And uh, we're just so glad that you're here with us and, uh, and enjoying these classes together as well. Uh, we also want to remind you that you can call in and receive your offer, free offer, a CD or DVD of these presentations. And you want to call in to 916-457-6511 or you want to write in to csh at saccentral.org. And this is offer number 21443. That's 21443. So please be sure you... Uh, you write in or call in and receive your copy of today's uh, study and class time. And uh, also you can visit our website and you can tune into these programs. Uh, they're up ahead of time prior to uh, each lesson. And so you can tune in and watch there as well at saccentral.org. And uh, so they're all there uh, for us. Uh, we also want to remind anyone that is here in our local congregation, if you have any questions you'd like to ask during the lesson time, or you, want, you have a comment that you'd like to contribute during the class, just go ahead and send that uh, request or that comment or question to csh at saccentral.org, and we'll make sure that uh, we're ready to go with that when, uh, when we come to study our class and lesson together. And those that are viewing us, you're welcome to send in a question pertaining to the lesson, this, uh, that particular week's lesson is well. And again, just go to csh at saccentral.org and uh, there you can there you can uh, connect with us, and uh, and if you have a, if you have any suggestions or uh, just we'd love to hear from you as well. Tell us how you're enjoying the programs and the studies. We love to hear from uh, from you. So here we are, getting ready to delve into God's word, and uh, we're talking about this morning being and doing, and we're in James chapter one. I want to invite you to turn there with me, James chapter 1, and uh, verse 22 is the memory text, and it simply says, but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. That's very interesting, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along here. Um, this, the study reminds me, uh, the class, the, the lesson we're studying here reminds me of a story uh, that I read about a, uh, a man who, it was really a, a story he told, where he told on himself and his younger brother. And uh, they, uh, well, he, he confessed every now and then that he wasn't always a good boy. And, uh, and sometimes when he got into trouble, his parents would send him to his room. And he and his brother, because apparently they both got in trouble at the same time. And so they went up to, the, go up to their room, but the punishment didn't work that well. It just so happened that... Uh, the boys had an escape out there, the window. Their bedroom was situated just above on the second floor, above the back porch. And outside the, that back porch was an old fruit tree that had grown there. And uh, it was sturdy and strong and, 
And so they would be sent to their rooms and uh, there they would uh, pretend that they were in their rooms but they'd slowly crack open that window and they'd climb out that old fruit tree and they'd go down that fruit tree into their backyard. They'd go through their backyard, over the fence and into the field and there they'd play ball and do various different things that uh, their parents didn't know they were doing. Uh, any case, uh, one day they heard, overheard their dad say to their mum, Mary, I think it's time that that old fruit tree came down. It, uh, it needs to come down. And so needless to say, the boys, they, they were undone. And like boy, young boys like to do, they, uh, they came up with a plan. They came up with a plan. So that night, they went to bed somewhat earlier, supposedly went to bed, only to get up a short time later. They gathered all the money they'd saved together, and uh, they went out the window, they went down the tree, went across their backyard, over the fence, into the field, into the city. And they ran around trying to find what they could. They found some, all the apples they could find, and some black string. And they came back from town, across the field, over the fence, into their backyard, to that old fruit tree, and they took the, the black string and the apples, and they just hung them all up over the trees. The next day, when Dad woke up, he went outside to chop down the old fruit tree and he came back in excitedly saying to Mary, you can't believe it, the most incredible thing that has, it, it, that's ever happened, this old tree that hasn't borne fruit in years is covered with all types of apples. I mean, you've never seen something like this. This tree hasn't produced, is covered with apples, big red apples. He said, I don't, I don't believe it. I can't believe it because it's a pear tree. It's a pear tree. <laughs> and of course, we understand the moral of the story is you tell the tree by the fruit it bears, right? Uh, apple trees don't grow on pear trees and pears don't grow on apple trees. Uh, these are known by, trees are known by the fruit that they produce. Christians are also known by the fruit they produce and people will be able to tell whether we are genuine or if we're trying to, quote unquote, tie good fruit to our lives. And so uh, let's go to Sunday's lesson. Let's unpack this very important study about being and doing. Really, it's about bearing fruit. It's about being a good tree that produces good fruit. Jesus talked about trees that are bad, that produce not good fruit, and then good trees that produce good fruit. And we want to be good trees producing good fruit. Amen? Yeah, for sure. So we're on Sunday's lesson, Knowing Your Enemy, and we're going to start right at the very beginning. At the very beginning. You've heard it said, we have met the enemy and he is us. And that came from a little cartoon called Pogo. A little cartoon, a little Pogo's cleaning up the, the, uh, the little creek there filled with trash and um, he realizes that uh, the environment is, is challenged because of our lack of care for it and uh, so it became a, became a very popular little line and a little cartoon. We have met the enemy and he is us and uh, we could talk and we could suggest that, that, uh, that truly we are our worst enemies when it comes to uh, salvation and it comes to the Christian walk. Uh, yes, there is an enemy and he is the devil and there's no doubt about that for sure. Uh, but remember what we studied the other week that the devil is successful with his temptations because there is something in humanity that is enticed by the temptation something in us, and it's called the carnal nature, this uh, bent toward sin. You can read about that in James chapter 1, verse 14. We studied that. There's something in us that, that, uh, that, that is drawn out after certain allurements, certain enticements, you see. And so uh, this is our carnal heart, this, this thing that strives for recognition and supremacy and leads us to feeling content with our own condition, that we're okay, we're cool and we're fine. We don't need to perhaps grow or progress. We're, we're just okay. Pride feels no need, really. Pride doesn't feel any need. Uh, you remember the prayer of the Pharisee. It's recorded in Luke chapter 18, verse 11, where he said, God, I thank thee that I am not like the other men, the rest of men, <laughs> like a me. I'm, I'm terrific. I'm doing well. A man who prided himself on his own accomplishments and was satisfied with where he was at. And of course, Jesus contrasted that individual with a man who smote his breast 
and, uh, and truly had a penitent heart. Uh, the Laodicean church in Revelation chapter 3 talks about that same, that spiritual pride that senses no need. Uh, Jesus says to that church, Laodicean church, that was a, a real church back in the first century that existed and had that problem, but also represents the last day church, uh, the, the last portion of Christian history that uh, the seven churches cover. Talking about God's people, this church, the Laodicean church, they don't know that they are rich, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked in Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. And you know, the, the interesting thing about this, when you read about the message to the Laodiceans, um, if you read that uh, and you say to yourself, well, that's not me, guess what's happened? It is. It's become you. If you read there that, oh, we don't know, we're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, and, uh, oh, that, that's certainly not me. If we say that, then we've actually, we've become what we've said we're not. Um, we all are in need and standing in the need of prayer and of Jesus and grace and mercy and growth. Amen. And so uh, that's the condition of the Laodicean church. There is no need of a savior. As a matter of fact, where is Jesus standing, standing uh, in, at that church? Is he on the inside of the church or is he on the outside? He's obviously on the outside because he's, he's knocking, trying to get in. So pride fills no need, you see. This is the condition of the church. This is the condition of, of uh, some. There are many reasons why, uh, and more so men, don't go see a doctor. Um, certain things have been listed. There's, well, I don't have a doctor, so I can't go see one. Or I don't have insurance, so I can't see a doctor. Um, I want to save money, so I'm not going to go see the doctor. Uh, doctors don't do anything, because when you go to the barber, they cut your hair, and you see, you see something, you see progress. You go to the dentist, and they whiten your teeth, and there's progress, but you go to the doctor, they don't do anything. Uh, we want to, men say, we want to tough it out sometimes. We'll just endure. Uh, we don't want to hear what we might be told, maybe to lose weight or get some exercise or eat the right foods. And we believe, and this is probably the biggest problem, we believe that there probably is nothing wrong. And when we suggest and say there is nothing wrong and we feel that there's something wrong, but we say there's nothing wrong, uh, we're not in a position to go seek help. And that's the similar condition that some people, many people, and some Christians find themselves in. And um, no need. We sense no need. Some people like to remain ignorant. And uh, because after all, what we don't know won't hurt us. But what we don't know will hurt us. Yeah. Hansen's disease teaches us that, uh, formerly known as leprosy. Hansen's disease. Uh, where the extremities uh, are numbed. And when they're numbed, there's no sensation or feeling of pain. And so if damage is done to the foot, let's say, that an individual stands on a nail, and because there's no feeling, they don't know that they've done damage, no pain. And if the person's not aware of that gash in their foot, then what happens? It's going to become infected. And then, you know, one thing leads to the next, and that foot needs to come off. And, uh, and so it's deadly when there is no, no system in place to tell you that, uh, that there's damage done or, or you need help, you need fixing. And some people are in the state where they're numb and don't recognize their need of a savior, you see. We're looking at James chapter 1, verses 21 through 27 here this morning. And uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to read all of that for us, if you don't mind, just to get the, the flow of what James is, is uh, writing here. Let's take a look here. James chapter 1, verses 21, and we'll read through to verse 27. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless." 
pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. There's a progression that I see that James is referring to here and talking about. And, uh, and verse 23 and 24, uh, James is, is suggesting that some folk look into the law of God, into the word of God, and they hear what it says, but they don't do it. Let's read that again. Verse 23 and 24, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. And, uh, and so the idea is, you know, you, you get up in the morning. Why do you go to the mirror? You want to see what condition you're in, don't you? And, well, some of us don't want to see what condition we're in, but we've got to do it because we're just about, we're going to be heading out the door and we don't want folk looking at what we're about to see in the mirror. And so we go to the mirror and we look in the mirror and the mirror tells us the truth. And that's the job of the mirror. It just tells you what, tells you the truth, whether you like it or not. And, uh, and so James suggests that someone who comes to the Word of God and reads it and sees instruction and knows they ought to do it, but doesn't do it, is like someone coming to the mirror, looking there, seeing their face, saying, ah, and then walking out and not doing anything about it. Maybe throwing a cap on, just to cover the mess under, the, you know, on top of the head there. Uh, it's the same kind of concept. Someone who doesn't want to make the changes. Someone who isn't willing to adjust. Um, Interestingly, and I want to compare Romans 7, verse 7 and 9. Just flip over there with me if you don't mind. Romans 7, 7 and 9. Notice Paul says, talking about the law of God, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. We'll just read verse 7. So what's the purpose of the law of God? The purpose of the law of God is to reveal sin, to reveal where we are out of line, out of step with God's word. God's intention here, the reason we have the word, is to reveal to humanity, yes, a savior, yes, a great savior, but it's hard to, hard to know that you need a savior unless you know you need a savior. You need to know you're sick. You need to know you're not well. You need to know you need help. And that's when you go looking for a doctor. That's when you go looking for an accountant. If you can't figure out your books at your workplace, things are messed up, you go looking for help. Until we get to the point where we recognize our need, then we don't have a need. And so the Word of God, the law of God, is designed to help us see our need. These people here that James refers to that hear the Word or listen but don't do the Word of God is like the, uh, is like the, the, the seed that in the parable of the sower in, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 4, where it fell, it fell, off the way, it fell to the wayside and uh, birds come and plucked it up there, just fell by the wayside, hearing the Word but not embracing it and doing the Word. The sincere Christian learns in order that he might do the will of God, not that, not, not that he might just know the will of God. So a sincere Christian, this is what we're talking about here, the sincerity of a Christian and what a true Christian looks like. A true Christian doesn't just search the word for head knowledge and to know God's will just for the sake of satisfying curiosity or just knowing it so you can answer a question or even perhaps even just to defend your faith. But the genuineness of Christianity searches the Bible for God's will so that we might do it that we might do it and we might follow it, you see. It's one thing just to look in the mirror just to see what you might look like. It's a completely different thing to look to do something about it. We must come face to face with God's word and accept the challenge and uh, not throw, as I mentioned before, the baseball cap over the mess underneath. Um, there are some texts we want to look at here that talk about the starting place, the, the starting point in our journey with God. And someone has for us Job 42 and verse 6 here. Job 42 and verse 6 right over here. Thank you very much. We're going to get to you in just a moment. But first of all, I want to take a look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3. Matthew 5 and verse 3. Notice what Jesus says here. This is the Sermon on the Mount, and we know this well. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, Jesus said, Blessed are what type of people in spirit? The poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
The place we begin with God is to know our spiritual poverty. That's the place we begin with God. God draws us to himself. I mean, it's not, that's not the, place we be, it's not the place we begin. God has been working before we come to him. He's working to draw us to him, to woo us to him, you see. When we come to him, we recognize his great love. We recognize that we fall far short of his ideals. We're looking into that law of liberty and we see that we're not quite where we ought to be. And we come broken in heart. We come face to face with the fact that everything we've ever done has been tainted with selfishness and even sin. Even the good things that we thought we did, they, you know, we had an agenda there. It wasn't all just clean. Motives weren't just all pure. And this recognition leads a person to penitence, genuine sorrow for sin, or repentance, you see. Ezekiel chapter 6, verse 9, uh, notice what Ezekiel said. This is interesting. He said, then those who of you who will escape, and he's talking about uh, those that are left behind in Israel. Uh, this is, uh, Ezekiel was taken in one of the um, displacements uh, under Nebuchadnezzar. He was there in Israel, Jerusalem. He was taken out with others. And there were some that were left behind, and some of them wanted to form an allegiance with uh, Egypt, and the prophet told them, don't do it. He said, that those of you who will escape will remember me among the nations where they ca are carried captive, because I was crushed by their adul adulterous heart. Notice what God is saying here. Some of you are going to escape, you're going to go among the nations, you're going to be carried captive, because I was crushed by your adulterous heart. God's heart was moved with sadness and sorrow because of the recalcitrance of his own people. And notice it goes on to say, because you departed from me, and by their eyes which play the harlot after their idols. Notice what will happen. They will, what do those words say? They're not words we commonly like to refer to ourselves. They will loathe themselves for the evils which they committed in all their abominations. God wants to bring each person to a point where they loathe themselves. Not dislike themselves, but loathe the things that they have done that have broken God's heart and that have hurt others. Okay, Job 42, verses, uh, just verse 6, Job 42, verse 6. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. So Job recognized his need and abhorred himself, and so what did he do? He repented and said, God, I'm sorry. And he cast himself at the mercy of Christ to, and to trust in his merits alone. So this is the starting point, the starting place, knowing our enemy and that we have seen and met the enemy and he is me. Knowing our great need of a savior. And then when we recognize our need and we abhor ourselves, then God can do something with us, can't he? Then God can do something with us. We're going to go to Monday's lesson. And let's follow the progression here, the train of thought that James uh, wants to take us on here. In this condition, God can do something with us. Uh, I want to take you over to Ezekiel chapter 36. Just run over there with me. Some of you were already there, but let's go to Ezekiel 36. I want you to notice here how Ezekiel puts this progression, where, how, the, how we begin in our journey with God and what God does in the, in the heart and in the life. Sometimes we get the cart before the horse. Ezekiel 36 and we're looking at verses 25 through 27. I want to make sure we get this, this order right because we're talking about being doers of the word. And uh, it's important that we understand, um, uh, we understand how God works in our lives to bring us to the point where we do. Some Christians think that just doing is what brings them salvation. If I do what I read and I do my best, then that's good enough. If I'm kind and I'm nice and I'm gentle and, and, and I'm, and I'm uh, you know, doing the, the right thing and I'm helping those in need, then that's going to be, that's my entryway into heaven. And that's not so. That's not so. So we want to make sure we get that right. Ezekiel 36 verses 25 to 27. Notice what God does. He says, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all filthiness and from your, all your idols. When does God cleanse us? When does God cleanse the sinner? 1 John 1, 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, right? So prior to us confessing, what's happened? Our hearts have been broken. We come with a penitent, contrite heart, recognizing our great need of a Savior. We come confessing, laying it all out before God. Here I am. 
I'm a sinner, I've done the wrong thing. And God says, it's okay, my child, I've made provision for you, be cleansed. And he cleans, cleans us up by the blood of the lamb, you see. So he cleans us, notice what happens. I will cleanse you, verse 26, I will give you a new heart. Notice what happens, God cleans us up and he gives us a heart transplant. And I'll put a new spirit within you and I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh or a tender heart, a soft heart, a pliable heart that will do my will. Verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments. And what is that next word? And do them. Did you notice the order, how this all lays out? It's the same as what James is referring to here. Got to know yourself. Got to know the word of God. Got to recognize your where you're at spiritually, fall on the mercy of Jesus. And that grace that comes into your life leads you to doing the will of God. It's God that works, Philippians 2.13, for it's God that works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure, you see. So it's very important that we understand the order of things here as God outlines them. He brings us to a point of repentance. He, those who he wishes to pardon, he first makes penitent. And uh, we confess and we're repentant and he cleanses and he gives us his, a new heart and his spirit. And that spirit works in us and walks, uh, enables us to do the will of God. Now, of course, there's cooperation. We, have, we must cooperate. God can't force us. We must consent to that work in our lives, you see. James put it this way in James chapter 1. And verses 21 and 22, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. So there it is again, coming in repentance, putting away the sin out of the, out of the person's life and receive the implanted word of God, which is able to save your souls. Casting off that filthy garment and receiving the robe of Christ's righteousness, you see. Powerful stuff. We trade our dirty clothes for Christ's robe of righteousness. You know, you see a picture every now and then of, um, of an individual who's wearing a, looks like a dirty garment, and there's Jesus behind him putting a clean garment on top. What person ever put new clothes on top of dirty clothes? Jesus doesn't work that way with us. He first, he, he wants us to shed our garments, our filthy rags. Here they are. Here's, our, here's, here's all my righteousness, which is filthy rags. Here, is, here are my sin. There it is. Take it. And Jesus says, now I will clothe you with my robe of righteousness. It's a transaction, a wonderful one that takes place that changes the heart, the motives, you see. Someone has Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 for us. Matthew 7, verse 21, right here. Thank you, Avis. Fantastic. We're going to get to you in just a moment. So let's remember that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit... Uh, waits for our consent. He waits for our consent to do his will. We have to exercise our will in order to cooperate with God's work in our lives. We can't just sit back and relax. We've got to consent and allow God to do that work. In Christ Object Lessons, page 272, notice these words talking about being doers of the word. The test of sincerity is not in words, but in deeds. A lot of folk have said a lot of good things, but there, no, there were no corresponding deeds. The test of sincerity is not in words, but in deeds. Words are of no value unless they are accompanied with appropriate deeds. Now, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 47, Jesus doesn't say, what say you more than others, but he, he instead says, what do you more than others? And then uh, we've got Matthew chapter 7, and verse 21, I think we're ready. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, that shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that, that doeth the will of me, Father, which is in, of my Father, which is in heaven. Okay, all right. So not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, who makes a good profession will enter the kingdom of heaven, but who? Those who do, there's that word again, those that do the will of my Father which is in heaven. And then in John 13, verse 17, Jesus said, if you know these things, happy are you when you do them. The Bible writers are not afraid to talk about works, to talk about what the Christian's duty is and what the Christian ought to be doing. In, in the first volume of the Testimonies, page 416, 
Uh, Ellen White wrote, wrote the, this, these two sentences. She says, every tree is known by its fruit. Our words, our actions are the fruit we bear. So the fruit is revealed, the fruit of the Christian is revealed in our words and in our actions. It's the fruit that we bear. And so when we talk about doing the will of God, we, we can talk about the Ten Commandments, we can, talk about, we can talk about the Sermon on the Mount. We can talk about the hard stuff that Jesus says to do, where he says, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that despitefully use you. Wow. That's not a suggestion, friends. It's a command. It's a command. God even asks us, and we have a question based on this issue, um, and Dina has that question. We're going to come to Dina in just, Dina, just a moment. Uh, have we got the microphone? All right. Thank you very much, Mike. Dina has a very important question related to this issue, but Jesus, when, we, <laughs> when you read the Sermon on the Mount, I mean, it's getting, it gets to the very heart of matters, doesn't it? You've heard it of old, thou shalt not kill. Jesus said, but I say to you, if you hate someone in your heart, you've already committed murder. Uh, talking about the seventh commandment, not committing adultery. Um, I tell you, Jesus said, if you lust after a woman, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Uh, the issues with God are more, go more than skin deep. And uh, God wants our entire hearts. So even the admonition to love our enemies, to do and to obey that, doesn't come easy. And, uh, and yet, we have to understand that we must, before we do anything that God asks us to do, we must be what he wants us to be. And that comes through the transformation that he works in our hearts. Um, Dina, let's take your question. How can we love someone that ruined our family? We may be able to forgive with God's help, but to forget and love, is it enough not to hate in God's eyes? Isn't that a good question? Is it, not, is it enough to not hate someone who's done damage to you or your family? Jesus said, what should we do to our enemies? Love them. He didn't say, not just don't hate them. He said, love them. But here's where the, here's where the trick comes. There are, there are a couple of words in the original Greek for, that we translate the word love from. Uh, one of those is agape love. Agape love. Agape love denotes the love of respect that values a person. And then there's filio or filian, which describes the love of emotion uh, that may exist, for example, between family members, husband and wife, uh, siblings, uh, parents and children, for example. Nowhere in the Bible, and this is very important for us to understand because this is a very important question because I think m many people in this room probably have experienced uh, some, um, some challenging situations and people in your life that have really ruined some things for you, perhaps. And, uh, and, and then, to, uh, then to love them. Um, for, what we need to remember here is what the Bible does not, nowhere in the Bible does it tell us to fill in our enemies. It never tells us to fill in our enemies. Fill in, remember, is that, that emotion, that love of emotion that exists between perhaps, like for example, family members. Nowhere does the Bible, does Jesus command us to fill in our enemies. Instead, he asks us to agape, agape, or agapen our enemies. In other words, to treat them with respect and courtesy and regard them as God regards them. It doesn't mean you have to bend over backwards for them. It doesn't mean you have to hang out with them all the time. But we need to let, the, the issue here is letting God so work in us that we view people as he views them. You remember Jesus said, as they were nailing him to the cross, Father, forgive them. Now, I'm not sure at that moment if Jesus had some real strong emotions and, and beautiful feelings for people who were nailing him to the cross at that moment. But that agape love he was the embodiment of agape love. And he agapian his enemies. He loved them, treated them as he would be treated, as God regards them. So I hope, hope that question, that answer helps. Uh, I think it's an important question, and we need to remember that God is not asking us to fill in our enemies, but to agapen our enemies. All right, let's move on to Tuesday's lesson because we've, we've got to roll right along here. I'm going to just touch on some points. 
uh, of each of these next few days here. Let's go to James chapter 1, verse 25. James chapter 1 and verse 25. <clears throat> Notice what he says. This is James continuing his thought. But he who looks into the perfect law of what? Liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So what is the role of the law according to what we've already looked at? It reveals to us our sin reveals to us who we are and, and our need of a savior. It points our sin. Romans 3.20 tells us the exact same thing. By the law is the knowledge of sin. And uh, it points out our sin, our need of a savior, but the law cannot save us. Who saves us? Jesus. Only Jesus saves us. That's right. In Psalms 19 verse 7, it says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Now, don't misunderstand. The psalmist is not saying the law converts, but the law is a very important instrument which leads to conversion. Because who, who's the one who does the converting? The Holy Spirit. Jesus through the Holy Spirit. That's right. He's the one that changes our selfish natures to become selfless. He's the one that makes that change, you see. Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. Uh, God says that he will... Uh, in essence, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, similar to Philippians 2.13, that God works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Uh, God says he will fulfill the righteousness of the law in us. Righteousness of the law is not fulfilled by us, but in us. It's the new covenant promise. God writing his law in our hearts and in our minds. Now, you know, we live in a world where there is a lot of disrespect for societal law. Uh, we live in a lawless land, a lawless society. And uh, there are Christians also since that seem to have regard, less regard, little regard for the law of God. And that's surprising. That shouldn't really happen. Why is that? Why is it that, that there are Christians who have very little regard for the law of God? Let me ask you a question. Does the devil appreciate God's law? No. He has no regard for it. He does not like it. Why is that? Why? Why not? Because he knows that it tells men their need and their need of Jesus. He, he knows that the law of God points to a savior. And he doesn't like that. He doesn't want folk to know about that. If the devil can eliminate God's holy law or make it obscure or inconsequential, then he removes the basis for spiritual revival. We were, in, we were in Romans chapter 7 just a moment ago. I want to take you back there. Romans 7 verse 9. Let's look at the finishing thought here. Uh, Paul began with us. He's talking about the law of God. I had not known covetousness except or lust, except the law had said thou shalt not covet. Look at uh, Romans 7 verse 9. Notice Paul's experience. Now this may seem a little odd, but uh, just bear with me here for just a moment. It produces, the law of God produces, is the basis of spiritual revival. Romans 7 and verse 9, notice Paul says, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. There it is, the beginning of spiritual revival. Did you see it? He died. Before the law came, he said, man, I'm good. I'm clean living. I've done all these good wonderful things and he was self-satisfied but then he looked into the law of God and he said ah oh. and he, he came undone he said wow he said I died I recognized I was I was not good I was not righteous and the law brought that to the basis of spiritual revival is is upholding the law of God you cannot preach enough the law of God just as long as it's done in, in conjunction with the grace of God because it's one thing to recognize our sin, but it's another thing to recognize our Savior. And Martin Luther said, when I look at myself, I don't know how I could ever be saved. But when I look to Jesus, I don't know how I can be lost. And there needs to be that balance in our experience. The law of God points out sin and leads us to a Savior. And that's why the devil hates God's law. That's why he's got Christians and even preachers teaching that the law of God is inconsequential. You don't need to obey it. You don't need to uh, worry about that. And like I've said before, if you have someone tell you that, just reach into their back pocket and take their wallet without, them, without asking them because then it wouldn't be stealing because there's no law. Well, don't go ahead and do that. I, my preacher said, go, no, don't do that. Is the law, is the law of God a burden? Is the law of God a burden, a device to keep people unhappy? 
Absolutely not. That's right. How, how is it possible that the law can be referred to the law of liberty? Isn't it, doesn't it hinge us, you know, hedge us in, uh, prevent, prevent us from being happy? No. Guardrails, when you are driving through the Sierras, do you like guardrails on the side of the road? Do you like those? I do. Because what happens if you just lost control? That's a long way down. It is. But those guardrails are there to keep you on the road, right? They're there for your safety. They're for your betterment. They're not there to make motorists' lives miserable. It's not there for that. They're there to preserve lives. Stay on this side and it will free you from a car accident, yea, even death. When God's law is brought into the life and obeyed out of love, then we experience true freedom. Freedom from false worship, which produces unhappiness. Freedom from overwork, which promotes sickness and broken homes. I'm talking about the Sabbath commandment there. I mean, it promotes freedom from challenges and problems. But always remember that true obedience, which comes from the heart, is impossible without genuine conversion. You can't keep the law of God truly and really if your heart hasn't been changed. You can try to manufacture change. You can try to force yourself to obey. It's not true obedience. Basis of all true obedience is love, love for God. So the law of God is certainly a law of freedom, the law of liberty. And it is that that by which we are judged. But thank God Jesus has a plan to write that law in our hearts and in our minds and to save us entirely. Let's go to Wednesday. Useful or useless? How do we define true Christianity? There's a lot of versions of what is termed Christian today or Christianity today. You're a, you're a Christian if you vote for a certain particular candidate, a Democrat or Republic or Independent or whatever. You're a Christian if you vote for a particular candidate. You're a Christian if you just merely attend church. You're a Christian if you say you are. <laughs> but what does true Christianity look like? Here in uh, James chapter 1, we'll continue reading verse 26 and 27. Notice what it says. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is what? Useless. Or in vain. Verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble. Now, of course, we can compare these verses to Matthew chapter 25, where Jesus talks about the parable of the sheep and the goats. Wherein have we done, clothed you and fed you and visited you? And Jesus said, as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. We could compare what Paul, uh, rather James is saying here uh, about uh, visiting the, the widows and the orphaned, etc. In Romans chapter 12, verse 9 through 18, let's just jump over there. Romans chapter 12. We have a question regarding the genuineness of Christianity. I think, Richard, you've got that question. Romans chapter 12, just jump over there with me. We want to get uh, Richard set up here. Romans chapter 12, and we're looking at verses 9 through 18. Notice the hallmarks of Christianity. What does true Christianity look like? Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. And verse 21 says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with what? With good, amen. So evidence of genuine Christianity, number one, as James puts it, is a bridled tongue. Not, uh, not like a horse that is without bridle and without hope. Some folk have no guard that's set before their mouth. I mean, just, just stuff just comes out. I'm not going to mention the glue stick chapstick thing again, but I think you got that. Here, here James is encouraging us to use discretion in speech. Remember Jesus said in Matthew 12, the, uh, for whatever, uh, from out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what we say 
reveals what's in our hearts. God wants all of our hearts. He wants us to be Christians. And so we can do what he wants us to do. And then the second evidence of genuine Christianity, according to James, is that we provide support for the less fortunate. Now, he's not offering a whole description of true religion or whole religion, but he's offering just two very pertinent examples. In essence, Christianity is useful and in essence leads to a practical life to benefit those who often get overlooked. And in the Ministry of Healing, page 470, uh, Ellen White says, no other influence that can surround the human soul has such power as the influence of an unselfish life. The strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. It's one of my favorite quotes. A loving and lovable Christian. To such a life, to exert an influence, costs at every step self-sacrifice and discipline. It is because they do not understand this that many are easily discouraged in the Christian life. So to be all that God wants us to be requires sacrifice and hardship and challenges. Those are God's tools as instruments to purify us and refine us. But the, the strongest argument in favor of Christianity is a loving and lovable Christian. You may have all the best answers to the most challenging theological questions, but the best answer is to be loving and to be lovable. May God help us. Richard, you had a question. Yes, Pastor Chris, if the if the evidence of genuine Christianity is seen in good deeds, then why in Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 and 23, does Jesus declare that certain ones who have done a host of good things are lost? Okay. All right. Did you get the question? All right. Matthew 25, folk are commended for doing good things. And uh, we'll be saved at last. Matthew 7, Jesus denounces some folk who've done some good things. Let's take a look at that real quick, Matthew 7. Let's jump over there. We've got just a few more moments, and uh, we'll see if we can't wrap up here. We may just have to wrap up on this question. Matthew chapter 7, and verse 22 and 23. Okay, so Jesus says here, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. And here's the reason why. Ye who practice lawlessness. That's right. Jesus does declare that certain ones who've done a host of good things, even for the church, are going to be lost. Why? What's happening here? Now, this is not a contradiction to what Jesus is teaching in Matthew 25 regarding the helping of the less fortunate. This is all about a matter of the heart. You remember the rich young ruler? Rich young ruler said, hey, 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 what do I do, Jesus, to enter into life? Jesus said, keep the commandments. He said, I've done that from my youth up. Jesus said, then go sell everything you have, give to the poor, follow me. Did he keep all of God's commandments, truly? No. No. He said he did, but which commandment did he violate when he couldn't give, give up all his goods? Number one. And number... Someone said at number 10, yeah, there's two. So he, he, he truly, God didn't truly have his entire heart. So the issue here is not always about doing the right. Some folk think that because they, because they help uh, go sing at nursing homes or they do this type, these types of good things, they can do them to atone for some wrong things that they are doing elsewhere. And you can't do that. You can't do that. All right, Lord, yes, I know I'm not keeping all your commandments. I know, I know I'm not keeping the Sabbath, but I'm going, I'm going on a missionary trip, and surely that will appease you. No. no. The issue here is not the, the good works. The issue here is that they're not coming from a pure heart, a heart that has been fully and totally surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Well, um, James has offered us a lot of very good advice here and a great question. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate that. Uh, on Thursday's lesson, James encourages us to be unspotted or unlike the world. And I'll finish this with uh, this class with James chapter 1, verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That does not mean that you hide from the world. It means that you don't let the worldly influences, influences that are contrary to God's will, influence you. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, be not conformed to this world. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is good and that perfect, acceptable will of God. That's the answer. 
allowing God to transform our hearts. True religion, true religion leads a person to hunger and thirst for God's word and, and to take this word to others, to bless and benefit humanity. May God help us be all that God wants us to be. May he truly have all of our hearts. May he have all of our minds. May we allow him to, to, to train our hearts to be more like him. And then it would just be natural fruit to do his will. So glad you joined us this morning. And certainly those who've tuned in, don't forget, call in. Uh, and receive your free offer and it's offer number 21443 you want to call into 916-457-6511 or you can email csh at saccentral.org so glad you've tuned in and uh, God bless you and God bless each one of you here today